Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Ken Hayes, Philip Shane, and Paul Boyer. Coming up on DTNS, is the old 321 rule for backing up your data outdated? Patrick Norton tells us about some other methods you might want to think about. Plus, algorithms are starting to make video editing easier. And has all the excitement gone out of technology? Spoiler, we don't think so. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, October 21st, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Somewhere in St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We have a wonderful uh, uh, collection of stories and philosophical questions. Well, one philosophical question for you today. Let's start with a few tech things you should know with the Quick Hits. Here's a bunch of Twitter news. And I use the word news loosely. Washington Post sources say Elon Musk has been telling investors he was going to cut 75% of Twitter staff once he took over the company. Keep in mind, Musk often says things that may or may not end up being the things that happen. Uh, the sources also said that Twitter had already planned to cut 25% of the staff anyway before Musk took over the company. But Bloomberg got a hold of a memo to Twitter staff saying there are no plans for layoffs, but it doesn't know anything about Musk's plans once he takes over. I, Bloom <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, I feel so bad for the morale. But wait, there's more. Right <laughs> yeah, I saw an employee on Twitter on, uh, saying, uh, my, my last 30 years uh, since I started a month ago have been amazing. Uh, Bloomberg <laughs> also has a source that says the buyout of Twitter is on track to close by the court and post deadline of October 28th. But Bloomberg also has sources saying the U.S. might conduct a national security review of not only Starlink, uh, for Musk's internet deals, but also of his acquisition of Twitter. And it's possible that the U.S. could end up blocking that deal, which some people suspect would not upset Elon Musk much. None of these stories is official. Here's what we do know about the pending acquisition of Twitter by Elon Musk. Virtually nothing. We actually know almost nothing. So, these, you know, stay tuned for actual things that happen, and, and we'll tell you about those. I'm just terrified by all of that. I'm just going to leave that right there. Um, my goodness. Sorry. I uh, just lost my screen there. Well, Thursday, Google rolled out my ad center. Tell us about that. Thursday rolled out my ad center, which lets users turn off targeted ads. You can still use search maps in Google Assistant as you normally would. The ads will just be less relevant. Users can also turn off targeted ads in YouTube without impacting video recommendations. Users can also fine tune ads in my ad center by requesting certain types of ads be shown more, less, or not at all. Uh, here's another thing that people are disputing is real or not. Forbes had sources that told it that ByteDance planned to track the location of specific U.S. citizens using GPS coordinates collected by TikTok, uh, oh, which sounds like something you should click on. However, TikTok says it does not collect precise GPS location information from users, which sounds like something TikTok would want to say in response to that. So who knows? Fortunately, we all have the vaccine or all the vaccine. Sorry, bad joke. YouTube raised the price of its YouTube premium family plan from $17.99 a month to $22.99 per month. And because Apple takes 30%, YouTube charges more in the Apple store. So there it will cost you $29.99 a month. A single YouTube premium account is staying at $11.99 a month. So it still saves you a couple of bucks, even if you only share it between two people. And the you can share up to six accounts. Well, YouTube Premium includes ad for YouTube viewing, downloadable videos, YouTube music, and background play. Yeah. So, ad uh, free. Ad you know, free. you can you can not pay for the increase or or not. That's up to you. Uh, when Johnny Ive left Apple three years ago, Evans Henke took over as the head of industrial design. Given Apple's history of industrial design, there was a lot of talk about what might happen without Ive in the room every day, and uh, not much happened one way or another. Apple didn't knock people out with innovative design, but it also didn't see a steep decline. I'll pause to let people complain about whatever notch or camera bump they hate. Okay, feel better? Thank you. Good. Uh, Apple has not announced a replacement, and Hanky is staying in her role for six months as part of the transition. So it doesn't seem like it's a hostile departure. Bloomberg sources say Gary Butcher is leaving Airbnb to return to Apple. So if that turns out to be true, maybe Butcher is going to take over. Keep in mind that Ive was still hanging around as a consultant until this past July. So this may be Apple marking a new chapter in its design strategy, though Apple did emphasize in a statement to Bloomberg that its design unit is full of folks who've been there for decades, have lots of experience. So, honestly, I wouldn't expect too much change. I'm going to refrain my comments to myself. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, let's get philosophical. Shannon Valor has an article in MIT Technology Review called, We Used to Get Excited About Technology, What Happened? Valor wins some points with me by reminiscing about the Commodore PET and the Concorde, uh, the supersonic jet. But mostly her complaint is, quote, about modern tech's spiral into user manipulation and surveillance, right? We've heard that time and again. She says the goal of consumer tech used to be design and build something of value to people, give them a reason to buy it. But today, it's about monetizing an ongoing data stream. She scores some points with me again by using John Deere as an example of this, as it fights farmers' desires to, you know, repair their own tractors that they own. Uh, she's concerned that engineers have been directed away from infrastructure projects, that they're not seen as sexy. They're just seen as a burden that the government has to take care of. <laughs> and all the engineers are making all their money on data stream projects. In the end, she says... Technologists' apparent loss of interest in humane innovation is depleting our collective faith in our own powers of invention. But I ask you, Patrick, is it the technology that has changed or is it our perspective on it that has changed? Oh, my goodness. I, you know, every time I think I'm, I'm, I'm over technology, it's done. I, I see, you know, a SpaceX rocket land on a barge and I get giddy. Um, you know, it's it's amazing to realize people think like, oh, there's nothing good. It's all boring. It's all surveillance. It's all monetized. But I, I think about everything that's gotten better, and even in the last few years of my life, where you know, streaming music, headphones, you know, portable audio, you know, it's just there's so much cool stuff going on right now. Um, but it's not spectacular in the sense of oh, we're not going to the moon. Oh, wait, actually, they are working on that. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I, I I feel. I, I disagree. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I actually I, think it's a well argued article. Uh, and yes. I agree with 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 Shannon Valor on a lot of her points. One of the things she noted was, yes, there are Raspberry Pis, there's open source projects that are thriving, there's programmable robots. But she points out that those are niche. And I think sure. that's the key. And not that she's wrong about that. But technology itself used to be niche. And what happened is some of technology that used to be niche, Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft, became right. massive. And now when we say technology, most people think of Amazon, Google, uh, Meta, uh, Apple, Microsoft. They don't think about the niche when in the past, all we had was the niche. If you thought about the big ones, they were very enterprising and kind of distant from people. But the big right. ones are now consumer level. So... That's why I think it's not about the fact that technology isn't exciting. It's about the fact that everyone can't help but see what these huge companies are doing because they're doing something huge every day. And what we've tried to do on Daily Tech News Show is point out that there's lots of other interesting stuff going on away yeah. from those big companies. It's just not getting all the headlines. One of my favorite examples, I'm sorry, I just I have to, to bang this drum again, is it. drone delivery. Amazon got all the press for drone delivery for years because they were able to appear on 60 Minutes. They've never had a product for drone delivery, whereas <laughs> Zipline is like expanding around the world. They actually started years ago delivering blood samples in Rwanda, and now right. they're everywhere, and they get none of the press. 60 Minutes hasn't gone, done a story on Zipline, uh, which is a real company. So it, it's, and I don't even blame 60 Minutes when I say that. I'm just saying we tend to look at the big stuff market cap companies because they are so big and they've done things to deserve to be there. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't look at the other places to say, well, they're not exciting anymore, but these other things are. I mean, you can also look at it. I was giggling at the beginning because you talk about, you know, the pet, the Commodore pet or the, the Commodore and the Vic 20 and the pet and the, Con yeah, yeah. you know, or, and, and the Concord. I mean, you know, not, a, I mean, we think of a lot of people as, as having owned like a pet or a Vic 20, but really not that many people own them. They're actually fairly exotic items. Even back then, you know, very few people ever flew on the Concorde, right? So there was, it was, it seems like, oh wait, now that tech is more accessible and has permeated our lives, it's not nearly as important. And I got to be honest with you, as much as I probably am as cranky as anybody in the planet outside of the iFixit offices about, you know, John Deere's relationship to making it difficult to repair, you know, repair tractors. But then you start looking at agriculture and the way GPS and super precise yeah. GPS and technology has radically, radically, radically altered, you know, how precise they can be 
you know, in the planting and, you know, in, in raising of crops. It's spectacular. Now, you could also be like, well, you know, what about, you know, this that's happened or this bad thing or GMOs? I get it, right? There's, you know, but people were complaining about technology 100 years ago. People were complaining about technology 200 years ago. They were just doing it in different ways. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. I, I feel like this is kind of a push and pull because we'll look back at our lives and, I mean, you know, it's, it's 1996 when the internet kind of blew up for most people. It's not that long ago. You know, the affordable cell phones were right. not that long ago. You know, cell phones, you know, having data everywhere. Starlink, which I have mixed feelings about, not because it's not a good product, but because the idea of not being able to get away from access to the office on any portion of the planet, except maybe the North or South Pole, is kind of terrifying to me because, you know, I, I, never being out of, of range of the internet is not something I... I I, it's a bug. It's a feature. It's a bug. It's a feature. Yeah, yeah, right. But but then you think like, wow, that's it's some pretty, you know, it's it's not going to get to every home, but it is spectacularly high performing, and it was a fantasy and two massive multi billion dollar failed businesses not that long ago. So I feel that there's still a lot of stuff to get excited about. Um, you just, I think you're right. You just have to actually pay attention to it because it's not always the thing that's occupying the big right. stories. <clears throat> Sixty minutes. Well, I I think that it's. I, I think that's the point is that we used to be able to use the word technology and people thought, oh, personal computers and Jesus. other technologies around that. And even then, personal computers in the late 90s were very niche. When we right. when we were working on the screensavers together, it was, oh, it's computers and other things around them. And a few people use them. The problem is technology now means the five most valuable companies on the stock market. So when you say technology, you can either mean it the way Shannon Valor does, and I think she's absolutely right when she talks about it that way, but I don't think you should discount the other parts of it that are the niche. There's a new niche. I don't know. Maybe we need a new term for it. Uh, or maybe we just need to realize that like, oh yeah, we're not always talking about big technology. Sometimes we're talking about emerging or small or, sure. or new uh, technologies in a way that we didn't have to, we didn't have to distinguish that back in 1998. Right. I think also so many extraordinary technologies are just so totally taken for granted right now. I mean, you know, yeah. how long have you been doing cord cutters for? Well, Cord Killers and Daily Tech Sorry. News Show are are just about the the same age. Cord Killers started in December at the end of December 2013, and Daily Tech News Show started January 2014. It's good that I've been listening to it on and off for ten years, and I still can't actually get the name right on Daily Tech News That's Show. That's fine. Uh, You're I'm not the only one. Engine. But but it's but right. But you think about that. You know. It was exotic and it wasn't particularly great in quality. And, you know, it's cord cutting. You know, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you the show I mean? wasn't either, but I know you meant cord cutting itself. Yeah. I meant cord cutting itself, but, 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 you know, remember when I, I can literally remember being like, Oh, Netflix is going to all streaming. Woo. There's going to be a smoking yeah, crater in the ground. Right? Yep. I was wrong about that one, you know? Um, but it's extraordinary when you realize the things we take for granted, you know, the fact that we're moving 4k movies, you know, over the internet into our homes and and you know you what what would have cost you there's a fortune there's no to way rent. people will ever be able to do that with data caps is was a reasonable take 10 years ago right I, yeah you know so i i feel like you know again there's a lot to get excited about if you kind of pick your battles there yeah you pick your excitements I, I think this next story is kind of an example of that. Uh, algorithms getting really good at a few things, uh, and video editing is one of them. Uh, Descript is a company where you can already uh, edit audio and video based on the transcript. So kind of like a word processor. You can cut and paste, and the video follows. The audio follows. It's not perfect. You still have to go in and do some touch-ups. Uh, there's another company called Runway which is a web-based editor. They operate in Chrome. It's in early access, so not everybody can get it yet, uh, but it's using some natural language processing to do things like video effects. So Runway's demo shows cool stuff like typing, make it look more cinematic, and it does a bunch of things. It doesn't just apply one filter. Uh, wow. Or you can select a streetlight in a shot and then type remove object, and it gets rid of the streetlight. Uh, it also promises to do some text-to-video generation. That's getting better as well. That's coming down the line. But the main attraction is being able to edit it by typing in text commands. If you get selected from the wait list, it costs you $35 a month. Now, you probably haven't heard of those two, but you may have heard of this next one. <laughs> so tell us about what Adobe did. The I am having difficulties with... 
Would you like me to tell you instead? And this week, Adobe entered the ring, which is usually a sign that a technology actually has some momentum. Project Blink can recognize objects like runway and use text editing like the script. Adobe also showed off searching through video by keyword, like looking for the part where people are laughing, for instance. It also promises to be able to remove verbal pauses like, um automatically, which is a blessing to think about. Project Blink is, of course, still in the research phase, but Adobe tends to move on things like this yeah. fast. We yeah, they, they've, they've brought some machine learning uh, stuff into Premiere, uh, so you can do some some filtering and, and things. Uh, so I don't look at this as vaporware. I look at this as an early peek at something that will come down the line. But I did like that Ars Technica pointed out, like, hey, Runway and Decrypt or Descript already exist. Like Adobe is not even first to the space. It's a clear example of what we were just talking about. Everybody hears about Adobe because it's Adobe. Right. Uh, but there's there's lots of folks doing this. And all, all three of them, and there's others out there doing it as well, I think are worth paying attention to. I think in almost any corner of technology, you can find there's a lot of companies you don't know about. I've been, I've been dealing with a bunch of actually, you know, video tools in another corner of the industry and it's it's one of those moments where you're just like wow there's a lot here that is you know they serve their niche their niche may be mm -hmm. fifty thousand people it may be a million people it may be a thousand people um but there's always more options out there and i think we probably rarely hear about a lot of them yeah Dar Dargannon asks, are we just at the point where new tech gets too close to scary sci-fi stories so everyone is looking at the downside um, I don't know if it's about the sci-fi stories, but everyone definitely is looking at the downside. I, I, and I don't know what the social reason is, but everybody wants to help enjoy how bad things are, no matter what the story is. That, that is a commonality everywhere you look. Five reason artificial intelligent video editing will ruin your life on TikTok. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I can already hear people like, well, it's not going to work as good as it says it will, which I don't know, maybe it won't. But, you know, we'll see. And it, it'll probably do something that's helpful. One would hope. Yeah. Uh, Amos is, is saying Descript doesn't understand breaths and will often cut them short. They have to be fixed individually. So, yeah, it, your mileage may vary. The, the tech is not necessarily perfect, uh, but we are advancing. And, and this is how we advance. We start with something that works kind of and doesn't work all the time. And then eventually you're just, you know, talking on phones all the time everywhere without worrying about, oh, I'm across the Bay Bridge and my cell signal went out. Like, which used Nobody to be a thing. Nobody remembers Internet Explorer 1.0, but 3.0 took over the world. <laughs> yeah, very good. Very good analogy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Internet 1.0 was crap. Uh, folks, what would you like to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. I've been over there talking to folks. Uh, so come join the conversation. It's fun. Backing up your data is a practice we strongly believe in uh, right here on the show. Certainly I do. I don't think anyone disagrees with me in the staff, but I, I really didn't check. So uh, let me know. Uh, for years, many folks, including myself, have recommended the three to one strategy, three backups, two on different media and one remote. So you have your primary on your laptop, you have a, a local NAS maybe, and then you have a cloud backup, right? Now that's still good advice if you don't have any backup strategy at all, but there right. are new methods gaining popularity, 32110 and 432. Pat, what's, what are these? Oh what's the goodness. current guidance here? So I was, I was working on backups for a group of podcasts I've been working with and, you know, because I'm me, because my mom lived at the Jersey shore, because I have family in fire zones, because I lived in an earthquake zone. I'm always thinking about three, two, one, right? Tom explained that it's good to go. But I was thinking as a, in the corporate environment that I'm working in with this group, it's like, Oh, you know, it really needs to be like three, two, one, one, or three, two, one, zero. And of course, Backblaze had already put together a really beautiful blog article about this, which is the three, two, one, one, one zero strategy or the four three two strategy. So let's talk about three two one one zero. This is essentially acknowledging that ransomware is a thing. It is an expensive thing. It is an incredibly dangerous thing, and it happens a lot more than people talk about. And it's actually something that a lot of companies have insured themselves against. Um, so the idea is you have three copies of your business data two different types of storage media. One of the copies is on an offsite location. And then one copy is going to be uh, offline or air gapped with the idea that this copy is stored in a way that ransomware cannot touch it either because it has no, it's air gapped. It has no connection to the internet. And so that's the problem that we're solving from 321 is 321 yeah. used to be air gapped by, because there was no cloud. Once the cloud came along, suddenly one of your, your remote backup tended to be connected. 
Yes. And so I was looking at this, and one of the things that Backblaze, and, and you know, I, I, I'm sure there are other options out there. I just happen to have a, I, I've been used Backblaze for years and Backblaze B2 for years. One of the things they have done to address the concerns of ransomware is their tool called Object Lock. And the idea is that it prevents a file from being, quote, altered or deleted until a given date. Hmm. Not a lot of storage platforms offer that feature, but the idea is that if this data is stored on their system under Object Lock, then it cannot be altered. They can the ransomware cannot touch it right you know and so you could do it where you you know you back up weekly or daily and then you pull the ethernet cable out of the box or whatever your magic mm -hmm. solution is me being sophisticated i would of course think of pulling an ethernet cable out of a box yeah, yeah. Um, but the idea is that you have at least one copy of this data that is untouchable. Right. And, uh, and so, so that, that lock that you're talking about is a software lock. Software yes. locks can always be broken, even if this one hasn't been <laughs> demonstrated to be broken. So air, like true air gapping is the safer one, but this, yeah. this is a nice option to have, right? There's yeah. a thing uh, I get we it. were, we were joking when we were, we were discussing, uh, earlier today with, you know, the rundown where I was like, I'm going to put my tinfoil hat down yep. next to yep. my computer. Right. Because one of the habits of working with, you know, in, in, in close proximity to a lot of security professionals over the last few years is that I tend to, yeah, I tend to believe it. Boy, if it's on the internet. It's somebody, somebody's okay object lock until it's object unlocked. Um, but again, it, it can be really problematic to do physical solutions for this. It's just a wicked rip and pain. So, you know, the Backblaze is in their case, creating a tool that gives them an additional layer of security. Um, Okay, so yeah. that's three, two, one, one, where we have one that's either locked or air gapped. Uh, yeah. What's four, three, two? So, uh, you know, four, three, two is the idea that you have four copies of your data in three locations, one on premise with you, one uh, at like an MSP or what they call like a, they are talking about continuity centers in this blog entry um, mm. where they are uh, a, a disaster recovery service, essentially, okay. uh, and, and store with a cloud provider. And then two locations for your data are off site. So, you know, their idea with that is that backups are duplicated and they are geographically distant. So if, for example, you know, the Pacific Rim blows up, <laughs> whoops, all the corporate data was in Washington and right. San Francisco, but those fell into the ocean. Well, the idea is that you're going to, to split those out. I should also mention that the case I didn't make it clear before, the, the zero in 32110 is that they want you to make sure that your data has zero errors. Because one of the challenges with certain backups media is that it can mm. decay over time. And if you do not have a system of making sure that data is reliably stored. Oh, okay. You know, you like tape backups. Tapes can degrade, right? Yes. Yeah. And something that's happening right now is a lot of places are finally starting to move from tape into things like, you know, Amazon S3 glacial storage, which is a super inexpensive uh, online storage. The trade off for that is it may take you 12 hours to get your data. So it's not yeah. instantaneous, but it costs a fraction of a cent or it's a very small amount of money per terabyte on that one. Okay, so, so. these are all sounding very enterprisey. So if you're in a business, even a smaller business, you, sure. you certainly want to look at these. Uh, do you, when do these apply to a home user, somebody who isn't running a business? <laughs> well, if you are, you know... Uh, you know, if you have a, if I mean, I, I think about it like a, a friend of mine lost their phone, they essentially lost every single photo of their child. Right, child wasn't that old. They had the phone for a long time, but they never really backed the phone up. So, in anybody's case, the first thing you want to do is get a backup, some backup, a second copy. This is not a backup solution. This is not a backup plan. But at least there is a second copy of your data. I think everybody should be moving in that three, two, one direction if they can. And I think, you know, the three, two, one, one. I, at some point, if you start being worried about ransomware, uh, or if you are just you are already in three, two, one land, and your boots and suspenders, and you want to stay ahead of the curve, I think then it's time to start figuring out like, okay, I'm going to air gap a copy of my data once yeah. a week. I'm going to back everything onto this hard drive. I'm going to unplug the hard drive, unplug the hard drive from the power supply, and you know that's taking it to the next level. I think if you're a hospital, you should have been doing this two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, because I, I think about that because so many hospitals have been slapped, stomped, beaten, and, you know, just it, the, the ransomware attacks have been unbelievably brutal. You should and, absolutely be on 432 or 32110 if you're any yeah. kind of critical infrastructure at all. That makes Please. sense. Yeah. For, for the home user, though, it sounds like 
if you're not on a backup, oh, do something. Uh, three, two, one yeah. is good, and it's good for most people. If you are, uh, you know, looking at your tinfoil hat sitting next to your computer, uh, maybe look at air gapping something. Yeah. Uh, the the old three, two, one, the one in the old three, two, one uh, was often you backed up all your stuff to a hard drive and then mailed it to somebody like your brother yeah. or sister, uh, and then your your sister would send the old one back for you to rewipe. I, I know I know more than one person who did that. Absolutely. You know, and the nice thing about mailing it to someone is they're probably not in the same geographic disaster yep. zone that you are. At least you hope yep. they are. So if the tornado um, hits your house in Southern Illinois, your, right. your, your sister in Texas, uh, hopefully didn't have a similar tornado. <laughs> yeah. Maybe send it somewhere that's also not subject to tornadoes, but yeah, yeah. You get me. Or, or yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of, there's, there's lots of natural disasters everywhere. Knock wood. We're not running into a lot of simultaneous disasters at this stage. Right. We All right. Uh, to get away from thinking about disasters, sometimes you <laughs> might want to go to a novelty themed motel. Uh, they're nothing new, but Chris Christensen shares news of Airbnb's plan to get in on the action. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. I don't know if you've noticed the trend of weird Airbnbs you can stay in. In Idaho, you can stay in one the shape of a potato. You can stay in an elephant in Atlantic City. There's one <laughs> shaped like UFOs, tree houses, one shaped like a shoe. Airbnb apparently likes the trend because they've raised what they call their OMG fund. It's $10 million, and it's going to help 100 different properties build out interesting and weird Airbnbs. So next time you're looking for a place to stay, maybe you can stay in a, I don't know, a cave, a bubble, or a bus. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Uh, this summer, we were looking at getting away. We ended up just going up and, and visiting some family and going to Napa. But uh, we were looking at Joshua Tree at one point, and there were some crazy looking places out there uh, that caught our eye because they were unusual <laughs> like that, right? I got a flood of TikToks one day, and it was like, there are a lot of cabins on the outskirts of Zion now, all of mm, which I want to stay at. Yeah. Also, I know the elephant of which they speak of Ooh. near Atlantic City. Patrick I'm, knows the elephant. It used to be a real estate office. Have you ever stayed in it? You haven't stayed in it. There was no way to stay in it when I lived in New Jersey. Yeah, okay, gotcha. <laughs> this, is, this is a new and exciting use for the elephant. You know the big clown that's by the liquor store in L.A. that you always see on ads and in movies and stuff? Yeah. They turn that into an Airbnb and stay in the clown. You can always stay in the clown motel in Tonopah, Nevada. Nice people. Yeah. Scary kind of sign. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, Eric wrote in uh, saying, gosh, you and Lamar talked about all these positive ad experiences. Uh, I want to be clear. This is not an email about how I hate all ads and all ads are terrible and nobody should have ads. I'm open to the idea of relevant ads that are interesting to me, but I could not tell you the last time that happened. I wonder if the difference has anything to do with the kinds of signals that we are sending to various advertising companies. Hmm. Uh, thinking about the ads I've seen lately, or at least the ones I remember, they were all for free to play games that I am uninterested in or scam me apps that promise to send me gift cards for playing free to play interest that I have no interest in on Twitter. I can't remember ads for anything other than Hulu's shows that is not relevant to me because I don't currently subscribe to Hulu and have no plans to in the immediate future. Uh, so I wrote back to Eric and I was like, Lamar and I were making an effort to say, well, let's not talk about the negative ad experiences because I think everybody has those. Let's talk about what possible positive ones were. Uh, so I told Eric, like, it's a glass half full, half half empty situation here. Uh, we We were talking about positives, but we also have these experiences that Eric is talking about. Right. Now, the Hulu one makes sense to me, which is... You say, I don't subscribe to Hulu and I have no plans to. Hulu hopes to change your mind by showing you a show that you'll go like, oh, actually, that looks over pretty good. So and over and over. That's and where over. it departs, right? It's right. fine if it keeps showing it to you more than once because we all tend to underestimate how often we see things. Sure. But these aren't good at gauging that. To the point where you do start to, and everybody talks about the one where you like, you buy a pair of shoes and then you just see ads for shoes for the next two weeks. And you're like, I just bought the shoes. I don't need another pair of shoes. Maybe shoes is a bad example, but you know, like. I think we get the point though. You buy I mean, a shovel. It's... You don't need a second shovel right away. <sighs> Or or maybe you do. Maybe they want you to return the first shovel and go back and buy the second shovel. I mean, doesn't seem to be the the best chance of getting you into something. Maybe if you bought a shovel, maybe advertise fertilizer or you know gardening equipment or something related to that. Granted, that does happen too. But thinking. 
I mean, this is why I don't get as worried about tar- ad targeting right. as some people because it's still not very good. Well, maybe now that you've talked about it, someone will actually be motivated to make it better and it will stalk you throughout the dark. If only I were the one who could make that happen, I would be very pleased. Yeah. Maybe you've inspired it right now, Tom. Who Thanks. knows? <laughs> Uh, well, and that's what we were talking about yesterday. And, and Eric understood. He's like, oh, okay, I, I, I get it. But uh, yesterday we were like, if ads were relevant all the time, most of us wouldn't mind them that much, right? What we want is control over our data so that it's not going to anybody we don't want to have it. And we want the ads that do use our data to be relevant, to be things like, oh, I'm glad I found out about that. I just want to, the websites I want to read to actually not go out of business, but I'd like to see as little that advertising too. as possible. So, yeah, you know. Uh, well, busily behind the scenes uh, drawing during this episode is Len Peralta. Uh, Len, of our many topics today, which one have you chosen to illustrate? Well, you know, I get ex- you know, I get excited about technology. I think it's still really great. There are really a lot of things going on. And I what today's drawing kind of illustrates what happens if you lose some of that interest, some of that excitement. This is called Hooray for Technology. <laughs> and um, it's sort of uh, taking you through the process. There's someone using uh, what I would think is an Oculus Rift, just an iPhone, uh, a drone saying hooray. And then the final panel is just, is dead. You, you're dead. If you don't get excited <laughs> about technology, you just you just wither and die. Uh, so, and you have a bigger screen, apparently. And you have a, you do have a bigger screen, yes. Uh, if you want to check this out, this image is uh, right now at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. Uh, you get it free if, you, uh, if you're if you a backer. Uh, you can also do it the old-fashioned way. Go to LenPeraltaStore.com, where, of course, I am selling my uh, custom-drawn co- um, holiday cards as well. So you nice. may want to get on that. We're getting closer and closer to the holidays, so jump on that if you can. So, Patrick Norton, what have you got going on? Still doing AVXL with Robert Heron. We're going to be talking about... Uh, well, some exciting things about subwoofers and why subwoofer, let's just, you know, if you're thinking about subwoofer speakers, you got a new television to buy, do me a favor, search for AVXL, A-V-E-X-C-E-L on your favorite podcatcher or email ask at AVXL if you got a question for us. Listen, one of my favorite peoples in the, in the, in the world recently is Ben. You know why? Why? Ben just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Ben. Be like we, Ben. Yesterday, we were like, I don't know. We got these two new patrons. They seem awesome. But what about tomorrow? Will we have a new patron tomorrow? And Ben raised his hand and said, yes. Yes, you will. So thank you so much, Ben, for backing us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Ben and all the rest of the patrons stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Nika Monford. Good to see her. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gautarama, Paul Reese. Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Modern video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's shows included I as Actar, Scott Johnson, Lamar Wilson, Patrick Norton, and Chris Christensen. Guests on this week's show included Blair Bazdrich and Dave Hamilton. And thanks to all all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>